This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. If you're a seeker, don't miss the inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening, Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles shamanic counselor and indigenously trained dream decoder Sandra Cochran's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers throughout the Americas. Sandy's initiations across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt, combined with her knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth, influence her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private readings, sacred international journeys, a meditative CD, and her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate your earthwalk and create a deeper connection to yourself. Find this and more at her website, starwalkervisions.com. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st Century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. Good evening. I am joined today by Ruben Uarte, who is a UFO researcher and a friend of mine. Ruben graduated from Cal State University at Haywood Hayward East Bay with a BA in Psychology and Latin American Studies. He's a member of MUFON as a field investigator, a, a state section director or state director for Northern California and a deputy director for investigations and international affairs. Ruben currently serves as a board member for OPUS, which is the Organization for Paranormal and Support Understanding. The mission of OPUS is to educate and support people having unusual or anomalous personal experiences. He has been interviewed on many local and national radio shows and television documentaries on the subject of the UFO phenomenon. He has authored a number of books, co-written with uh, Texas UFO researcher Noah Torres, who you remember has been on this program, about UFO crashes and other historical cases that have occurred along the border of southwestern United States and Mexico. Ruben, welcome to A Different Perspective. Thank you, Kevin. It's, it's great to be with you and, and your audience. And uh, I must say, it, it's, it's an honor to be on your show because you are one of my favorite uh, researchers and someone that I've looked up to. I, I uh, have to share a story with you. Uh, I think you might get a kick out of it. But I, w- I went to my very first MUFON um, symposium in, back in 1992, and we were flying. I was flying to Albuquerque, and I was reading your book uh, you, uh, on um, the Roswell UFO crash. And we were hit by lightning, by storm. <laughs> we uh, that that plane was just was just being pushed around. And when I, I when I looked at the title of your book and I, I saw the word crash, I said, "Oh my God! I got <laughs> I thought we were going to have one." But every time I was running into turbulence, I always think of the cover of your book. And of course, I read the book; it was great. But you know, I always think of you. Well, I'm glad we can give you some enjoyment in that moment of terror. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, I was, it was it was amazing. 
I always think of the scene in, uh, I think it was uh, Airplane, where they're showing the movie, and the movie is of airplane crashes uh, and tests, tests like that to get the passengers all set to, to go that way. <laughs> wow. So, well, it was, I was certainly tested, but it, it's great to be on your show. And, and uh, I know that you, over the years, have done some great work, and um, I always learn from, from the best, so it's just, well, it's just great to be. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say those kind words to me. Uh, you know, I've uh, the question that is often asked to me is, you know, how did you get interested in UFOs? And I always uh, kind of cringe at that question. But I noticed that uh, you sent me some notes, and that is one of the questions you wanted to be asked. So, what got you interested <laughs> in the UFO phenomenon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. The- you know, I'm always curious uh, myself um, when, as as I meet people um, from all walks of life, what what is it that got them so involved in this? And over the years, I've met people who've had their own personal experiences or know of loved ones um, that have had had an unusual encounter, and uh, then then of course you come across all you know diver- the diver- diversity of people that have had. And, and people of, 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 uh, that are credible as well, and, and those stories stay. But it really, it, what got me started, um, Kevin, was uh, as, as a young, young kid, um, and every time I, I, I share this story, it's almost, and you know, it's like I could see it right when I was, I think I was about either seven or, or eight years old, but... Oh, probably a little younger, actually. I was, uh, our, our home, well, I lived in a two-story apartment, and right, and then next door was a, uh, a library, and there was a playground, and so that one day I was, I was there in the playground, and I looked, I, I looked toward the hills, and this is in Oakland, California, by the way, and this is in the 50s. And well, Ruben, Ruben, let me interrupt mm-hmm. you there because we're, we're getting short on time here. So we'll leave you in the hills of California for a few moments and uh, come back to find out exactly how you got interested in the UFO phenomenon. Okay. It, and for more information on uh, today's program and some of the others, take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. We will be back right after this, so please stick around. Zone Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. 
If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today, Know the Name, Know the Person, or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. And we have returned to learn what happened to Reuben. Uh, while he was in the hills of California, uh, trying to tell us why or how he became interested in UFO phenomenon. So I, I interrupted him, so we're going to give him the floor and let him uh, take another shot at it. So, Ruben, it's up to you to tell us how you got interested in the UFO phenomenon. <laughs> uh, and I'll try not to be so long-winded, because I know an hour can go by so quick, and, uh, and I know you have a number of interesting questions to, to share with, with me and and, and with the audience here. But um, actually what happened, Kevin, was that I was there at the playground and I saw this thing uh, up uh, toward the south southeast corner of the sky. And at first I thought it was a balloon. I just kept looking at it and it was oval shape, round. And I kept looking at it. I said, how come that balloon stopped moving? And that's the thing I thought it was. It was a balloon. But as I kept looking at it, it um, it just remained there. And then I had this un- uncomfortable feeling as that was, I felt like I was being watched from it. And so as I looked closely, it was somewhat of a silver from the transparent but silver color to it. Um, so I ignored it, and then the, the next day or so, uh, I went back to the same playground, and I met my friends, and we were playing around. And then all of a sudden, my friend uh, looked up straight up into the sky. I'll never forget his expression because he's just pointing his his fingers right up into the sky, and he says, "Look," he says, "Oh wow, look, a flying saucer." I turned around immediately, and I didn't see it. I just looked at him uh, because I was just surprised what he said. And then uh, I just thought, geez, I wonder if there's any connection with uh, with that, um, with what I had seen the day before. So anyway, it, it gave me a curiosity uh, later on, Kevin, because I – became more interested in science and aviation. You know, I always wanted to be a jet fighter pilot when I was a kid. And at that time, we were getting into the space program, so I grew up in the 50s with that. But I just had this curiosity about that. And then um, later on in life, um, I read the book uh, Communion, Whitley Strieber, um, Bud Hopkins' book, Missing Time, and in there they mentioned MUFON. And uh, so I was very curious about that and found out that there was a MUFON chapter in the area that I lived. And so I, I attended that, the first meeting, and was very intrigued with the people, the caliber of people that were there. And so I became a member, and over the years I just started to um, move up gradually and I, I can't believe I have close to 25 years now with the organization. And well, let me let me interrupt here and ask you a question. Mm-hmm. So you you saw this balloon, which you now yeah. believe was a flying saucer or a UFO. Yeah. Um, 
and the, the, the thing that comes to my mind, does that kind of bias your investigations because you've seen this thing yourself so you know in your own mind uh, that there's, there's visitation? Does that, does that color your investigations in any way? No, I have to always try to remain neutral on that too. Um, obviously, yeah, because I had an, I had another really remarkable uh, experience. Besides, I mean, uh, back in uh, 1964, where I had closely saw these these uh, bright orb shaped objects um, that disappeared when one of my friends picked up his camera to, to film them. But um, but in terms of investigations and that, it's it gave me the interest. Uh, but uh, obviously, um, you have to become non-biased. When in our MUFON protocols, we have a set a set of standards, set of questions, and that uh, you need to ap- apply when you're when you are investigating and and interviewing a witness to get get the. The story, so it's uh, something that we always have to be very careful about. When you, um, well, you've investigated lots of cases. I guess is where I'm going with this. What is, uh, what are some of the, your favorite cases? What do you think are some of the most um, bizarre, uh, strange cases? I shouldn't really say bizarre. That kind of implies uh, something I don't mean. I mean, just what are some of the strangest cases that you found that suggest uh, there might be alien visitation? Well, God, uh, that's a good question too. Because uh, over the years, I uh, wanted to share with you that um, I've had the opportunity to do some traveling. Um, I got connected with a UFO tour group, um, which I, when I went to England in 1994 on my very first crop circle expedition, and I later. Um, I, I I really enjoyed the tour, and I got along very well with the uh, tour management people. And uh, they hired me. They said, we would like you to become a, a tour guide, and we'd like you to help us out with our tours. And that was one of my other boyhood dreams, where we went to these UFO hotspots and encountered and, and met with a number of the local researchers, as well as talking to various people. And there's a, a number of interesting um, cases that just stand out in my mind. Um, you know, when we went to Mexico, for example, um, I met with a group of people that were sharing with me how they saw these strange objects just hovering or flying into the, vol- the, vol- the volcano on Mount Popocatapetl. When you say when you say uh, strange objects, are you talking about uh, lights, or are you talking about a structured craft type thing? Um, the way they were described to me was um, they were lights, um, but they were flying in a in a V formation, and then they would simultaneously each light would go down into the crater, and the, the gentleman would uh, just would uh, provide me some sketches and everything else and uh, with that. And then I remember um, um, some of the other people that start sharing their, their ideas um, or their, their stories about their sightings in that area. I think one of the, one of the most intriguing stories, and I, I don't want to get too much caught up in the paranormal, but sometimes it, this, you know, it does overlap when you go into a case or, into an investigation that sometimes you get really some um, more, how can I say, more information out on the fringe per se. So one of the, what I wanted to share with you that one of the, one of the most un, unusual stories that I had encountered was when we interviewed this boy uh, named Claudio. And actually I had first heard about this incident through a friend of mine that was connected with Dr. Uh, Dr. Greer, uh, they had gone to this to that part of Mexico before, and they've done some they done some uh, some field work. Well, I was in the same area and had encountered the, or I had met the same people that they met. And one of the one of the interesting um, events was when I met this boy named Claudio who said that he and a young boy, another young boy, they were herding some, some sheep and goats 
when all of a sudden there was a flash of light, um, and that flash of light um, scared the all the animals and and they formed like a protective circle. And these two boys saw what the what looked like three humanoids. And the humanoids, um, one of them was wearing. There were all three were wearing tight fitting clothing and they had big heads, large then the large eyes. This as uh, sounds typical of what people see many times. And what, except for this one creature, uh, or this one being had like almost like a beard on its chin, you know, very fine hairs. So that's what uh, how the boy described it to me. So the being told the boy that uh, it says we are there to prevent the volcano from erupting. We are there to prevent the others from erupting it, and that there will be a war in New York that will cause the entire world to go on alert. And immediately, Kevin, when I heard that, I thought, gee, what, does, what is this young boy talking about? And, and, you know, I was interested in, of course, his description of what he was sharing. But when he said that, that, there, were, that there would be a war in New York, this, uh, I, thought, I thought immediately of the first uh, attack of the World Trade Center and I believe that was what, um, 1993, I believe. Um, and so then I thought, well, maybe that's what he's talking about. But I found out later that this young boy really didn't, didn't know where New York was located at. And um, when we had the, the attack of the World Trade Center back in 2001, and uh, I began immediately thinking, well, how did this, you know, uh, this prophecy with this boy had shared? And you run into all these kind of interesting, unusual um, the experiences that people shared. No, I can't prove it or, in, or other than what it's his testimony, but the fact that, uh, oh, it, it did happen, you know. And the fact that he was able to describe it, it was in an area where there was a, a, a lot of UFO activity at the time in Mexico. When, when was this? So when was this? When, when uh, did, in, pardon me? When, when did this happen? When did you uh, interview this kid? I interviewed him. Um, we went, uh, went to Mexico in 1995, heard about his story, and met him in 1996. Uh, did he has he met with the uh, the beings again? Um, does he have any? Uh, that other? is some. That is something I is one of those things that I would love to meet with him again. And you know, it's been almost more than twenty years, twenty two, twenty three years since I spoke with him to find out what exactly has happened to him. Um, we do have a description about his story in our second edition of Mexico's Roswell, the uh, Chicago UFO, I mean the Chihuahua UFO crash, and talks about the, his the story. But I, uh, he's always, that is one thing I will, that's, I hope to accomplish someday is to track him down and find out what's happened to him. But, but what I do remember him saying was that after the event, that there was one evening that this, Bright light uh, was beaming down on top of their home, and that his parents uh, looked out and went outside of the house, and they were completely frightened. And they told the bo- or they told all the kids to stay in the house, and then that strange light went away. Well, Ruben, so, we're gonna have to take we're gonna have to take another break here because we're coming up against the uh, the break. But uh, if you want to know more about what's going on with Ruben Uarte, you can look at www.northerncaliforniamufon.com, all one word, Northern uh, California Mufon.com or www.mufon.com. And of course, she with uh, Noe Torres is involved with uh, www.roswellbooks.com. And as I say, you can take a look at uh, my blog, which is uh, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And I usually put up a short synopsis of what we've discussed on the program. And if there's something you've missed uh, for whatever reason, while uh, the program is on, you can. Uh, 
click on the link there and listen to it and pick up from where we left off. So we will come back here with Ruben Uarte talking about uh, UFOs along the uh, Mexico and southern United States borders and things like that uh, in just a few moments. So stick around. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. I hate repeating myself, but we are back once again. 
with Ruben Uarte, who is a UFO investigator, a researcher, a MUFON director for Northern California, and the deputy director for investigations in internal affairs, who has been doing UFO research, he claims, and I say that with tongue-in-cheek, 25 years, because people ask me <laughs> how long you've been doing UFO research, and I make up some number, but uh, I sort of began when I was about 15 years old, so it was a long time ago that I began. <laughs> Um, so you know, it's, it's nothing derogatory about Ruben. It's just that we've all been around for a long time looking into UFOs. You were talking about this uh, young man you'd met in Mexico. And I wanted to ask you, because he was talking about these alien creatures which sound suspiciously like the greys, which yes. are the uh, small um, five-foot-tall beings with the big heads, the big black eyes. But one of them had a beard. And uh, I wanted to ask you uh, – when he made this sighting, was it associated with a UFO observation or was it just these guys kind of out in the field surprising him? It was uh, the, the latter. It was basically it was a flash of light and, um, and he saw those three beings uh, standing on the ledge. And that's when um, – and when he, when he had contact with them, it was done telepathically as well. He he told us it was as if someone – he was hearing a voice in his head, <laughs> I was, which I, I was, found – I was kind of laughing about that simply because I was about to ask you, how did he communicate with them? Did it was verbally <laughs> or telepathically? And you, you sort of read my mind telepathically, I guess. So <laughs> there we go. I, I, I have to um, – you know, I, it, uh, I wanted to go back and, and I just want to say that I, I'm, I've been so very um, – uh, bless uh, working with my good friend Noe Torres, who you had on your show, and it's it's great to have a a partner where you could work uh, on on various projects, I know, on different different um, book projects as well as updated cases. As you know, we started to focus on UFO crashes along the Texas Mexico border and. In that, we came across um, some very interesting cases, but, but well, also me, that also. Mm -hmm. let, let me interrupt you just for a second because you know I, it, it, it springs to my mind. You're in California. Noe Torres lives in southern Texas, about 14 feet from the Mexico border. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean he's way down south Texas. Uh, how did you guys link up? This is uh, I, again. This is I would say synchronistic wise, um, and it was as a result of a uh, uh, of a documentary that was being put together by the History Channel. Um, they were doing a the History Channel was doing a number of uh, episodes related to UFO crashes. I, I believe you might have been connected with uh, with with one of those episodes because they. Went into Texas UFO crashes. They went into England UFO crashes, and then they went into Me then they went into the one case called Mexico's Roswell, uh, the um, case that happened in U in Coyame, where an uh, a object collided with a small airplane over the desert in northern Chihuahua. So, I and I was working with. The producer and we were they were we were trying to find someone who could talk about that story as well as so many other cases and many of these other investigators were were very busy and then the producer said well how about you and I thought okay well I'll, I'll do it so I was interviewed and uh, Noe at the time was very interested in doing doing a book on on Texas UFO crashes and other para uh, paranormal related events so he saw the episode and he had contacted me later and he said Ruben he says I'm very interested in what happened or can you share with me some of the information about the UFO crash in in, in Chihuahua and basically I, I got that information from some uh, from a document that was called the Denim Report and we went over it and and then he said, Ruben, how would you like to collaborate on a book and maybe we could do some other projects together? I said, sure. So uh, we've been working together now and on so for more than 10, 10, 12 years, and we've worked on um, together probably about seven or eight books, and then we also work with other authors too and on on their material. So 
it's it's been an interesting uh, ride for us. Uh, one of the goals that we wanted to do was to put together these small UFO conferences along the Texas-Mexican border, and, and which we've done. We've had UFO conferences in Presidio, Texas, uh, Del Rio, Texas, and Edinburgh, where normally uh, those kind of venues don't reach those communities. Normally, these UFO conferences are always in major cities. And so we went out and wanted to present these case, uh, a conference really close by to where these incidents have happened. And, and that, and I find that really unique for us because at, uh, you get people um, that might have seen something or experienced an event during the time frame of the research, which has uh, been very, very valuable for us. Have you had some interesting sightings come out of the conferences? I mean, people come up and tell you their uh, experiences. You've had something really interesting come out of that? Yeah, yes. And, uh, in fact, uh, this is really – um, our, on my last trip to Del Rio, Texas, for example, I was um, we were dr- driving uh, from the San, San Antonio airport, and when I uh, I had Nick Pope with me, and we're driving uh, heading toward Del Rio. Let me let me and, just, let, let me interrupt for just yes. a moment for for people who don't know Nick Pope was the uh, uh, in the Ministry of Defense in. Um, uh, England a number of years, and he kind of ran the UFO desk, so he's become sort of the, the resident English expert on UFOs from that point of view. For those of you who may not recognize the name Nick Pope, so you're going from San Antonio to Del Rio with Nick Pope, and? And so we're we're driving, and I had my headlights on, and all of a sudden uh, there's this vehicle in front of me um, coming the opposite direction. And I was driving this SUV, and I immediately, um, then I, all of a sudden, I looked behind my rearview mirror, and it turns out to be uh, a cop car <laughs> with his lights flashing. And so I immediately pulled over, and then the officer got out and said, hey, um, didn't you, you said you left your headlights on, you, uh, your brights on, you should have uh, changed them when I came within 500 feet of you. And I said, I, I wasn't aware of that. I, I said, this is a vehicle that I never operated. I mean, it's a rental. So then he asked, uh, asked me, he says, well, where are you guys heading? I said, we're heading to a UFO conference. And then his complete demeanor changed uh, immediately. He, he threw and you he on the said, ground, handcuffed you, and dragged you off to <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Almost, I yeah. That. I shouldn't have said that. Okay, so his demeanor changed. And he said, he said, he said, "That's interesting." He said, um, "He said I, my my mother uh, shared a story with us when she was young. <clears throat> she remembers seeing this 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 object, uh, almost like a flying saucer, coming and then flying over, and it landed down down <clears throat> in um, by the ranch." I said, "Oh, well, that's interesting," and then. And then he said, well, I'm not going to give you a ticket. You can just be careful and da-da-da. So on our way back, Kevin, on our way back, um, we had to stop at a Border Patrol um, point. And they're stopping all the cars, and, you know, we're getting in and driving in line, and we come up to the checkpoint. And then uh, immediately one of the Border Patrol agents uh, said, uh, where are you, where are you, gentlemen, from? I said, well, I'm, I'm from the. And then he said, are you a United States citizen? I said, yes. And then they, Nick Pope said, no. He says, I'm from from England. And then they, then he said, well, what business do you folks have here? And I, again, we said we're from, we're coming from a UFO conference. And then he immediately stopped and started to tell me, you know, he said, um, I, I. Not too long ago, I was on patrol, and I remember seeing the strange light of flying, zigzagging, and then it landed uh, down in this one part of the area up here, nor- north of where the checkpoint was at. And he said, and then he, but he was baffled. He said, uh, and then the other guy said, "Yeah, we get a lot of a lot of interesting sightings in this area." So there. There was another the other patrol agent. So here I have three law enforcement officers that are stopping us. First, they're intrigued by who we are or what we do, but they felt comfortable 
uh, enough to start sharing their their uh, their experience. And what got me was that they kept us there for for a, for a while, and we had a huge lineup of vehicles behind us. So uh, anyway, I gave them my my business card and everything else. But it, it's just interesting how you can meet anyone um, at a particular moment. And find out that what you have in common with them is uh, this the whole topic of UFOs. Did uh, the the border patrolman said that he, he saw one land? Did he give any more information? Did you get any more information about that? No, I, I, he said he he saw this strange light and that the light moved, you know, zigzagged in various, and then gradually it then descended behind behind a tree line over there in, in that area. And he so, didn't. Um, he didn't have an opportunity to go over and see what was behind the trees or anything. We we unfortunately, I, I, I unfortunately we, we didn't have enough time because we were in the vehicles and we had to get uh, past the checkpoint. But I would have loved to um, spend time and and get, get more additional information. It was, but it's just uh, the it's interesting. Right here we had three police officers that had shared their their, their experience with us. Does uh, when you're doing out doing these things or, or just out in general, uh, does it come up often that you do UFO research and and you end up getting UFO sightings from people? I I don't do it. Well, it depends on where I'm at, uh, Kevin. You know, obviously, if I'm at a conference or, but uh, normally, even when I'm going to different uh, non UFO related, I I just don't don't. Sh- um, advertise it but someone who's a friend who might know me uh will then share that information hey there's so such and such this is ruben who is a researcher and um and then these folks will come up and um and go ahead and start sharing their experiences <clears throat> I, I need to regress a little bit because um one of the things i i i see in and i would just be curious to, uh, from your perspective kevin is uh, too many. I think the, the, a lot of times, uh, a lot of us uh, do uh, preach to the choir. In other words, we go to, this, to these UFO conferences, may share our updated information to to the audience there. But these are people that are already either know about the subject matter or are believers or whatever. But I think the the focus should be that we should be speaking to the the non. To the mainstream audiences, you know, speaking at Kiwanis clubs, the uh, the Lions clubs, the uh, well, let me let me other, other let me interrupt you here because we're going to have to take a break. Mm-hmm. But it just kind of sparked something. I was asked to speak at a small group here at home in my hometown for a, uh, and I wanted to talk to him about my writing career, and I mentioned offhand that I had done some UFO research, and of course all the questions then related to UFOs and nothing to about what I thought was the interesting writing career. Well, we're going to have to take our final break here. Uh, when we come back, I want to ask you about cryptoids because you've done some research into that, and I think that's kind of interesting, and we don't really get into that much on uh, on the program here. So we will be back. Take a look at uh, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com for more information. And we are joined here, as I've said, by U- Ruben Uarte, who is a member of MUFON. We will be back right after this. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. 
No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, and of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program. For the secret to everything is for you, the listener. For those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover thesecrettoeverything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And we have returned from that long break. I say long, it wasn't long enough for me. Anyway, uh, and I don't have an idea what that means. Anyway, we're going to talk to Ruben Yarte about his uh, investigation into cryptoids. But before we do, uh, you might want to take a look at the uh, website, www.stopkillingbigfoot.com. There's a petition on there to sign. And if you'd like to uh, join in on that, just have people uh, not out there hunting Bigfoot, uh, take a look at the uh, position at, uh, as I said, uh, www.stopkillingbigfoot.com and sign the petition. Ruben, we were going to talk about cryptoids a little bit, and uh, maybe yes. you should give us a quick definition of cryptoids, and we'll run with it from there. Oh, God. I, I, I'll just make it simple. It's the study of strange animals, uh, strange entities that uh, really don't – that are – I just leave it at that. Just make it simple. <laughs> I, I was going to say controversial. Uh, Bigfoot would be controversial a is even a better word. Yes, yes. Bigfoot would be a cryptoid. Uh, chupacabra would be a, a a cryptoid. I think. So you've yes. done some you've done some cryptoid work. What what have you taken? What have you looked at? What have you found? Well, um, I, I need to 
kind of focus on, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Chupacabra because that was something really interesting. When I went to Puerto Rico in 1994 and I went on, on a UFO expedition with our uh, tour group, Beyond Boundaries, and right before we were leaving, we had a chance to meet with uh, a gentleman named Jorge Martin, who was telling me, he said, Ruben, he says, we're starting to find these strange animals, uh, strange um, deaths. We're finding that uh, chickens and goats and sheep and many of the owners are reporting that their animals are being killed and that the blood is removed. And... Um, and that uh, people claim to see the strange creature uh, hopping around and or, or flying or whatever, but it's a small creature that that has uh, big eyes and has almost kangaroo-shaped legs and has a long thrombosis or a long tongue. And, and so I remember when I left, and then right around the latter part of 94, 95, and, uh, there were so many different uh, sightings of chupacabra attacks and Puerto Rico, and then later it extended into the United States and down into Mexico, the Southwest. Well, um, and we went back in uh, 1994, uh, not, excuse me, we went back in the close, 1999, and <clears throat> there was a, uh, we did a documentary on, in Hunt of the Chupacabra, um, and we went, cl- we interviewed a number of witnesses who share their stories and that, um, as well as um, talking to city officials, and they're saying something strange is, very, is occurring on, on here on, in, on our island, these strange deaths. The biggest concern we have is that maybe this thing, whatever it is, may start attacking people, especially children. Well, when we, the big when concern we, of the mayor. When we say chubacraba, we're talking about, I think it's translated as goat sucker. Goat and, sucker, and, yes. And it... it yes. It, it tears tears out the throats of the animals and uh, sucks the blood, or or what exactly? Yes, it, uh, it it drills a hole into the neck, or and in one case, I remember there was a bull that was uh, attacked and killed, and there was these claw marks on the side, but there was this one hole in, in the back. Um, one of our expeditions uh, interviewed a veterinarian that would uh, do the necrops. Uh, let's see. Necropsy. Yeah, an autopsy, yes, of the animal. Yes. And what was the right term? That word Necropsy. always escapes me. Necropsy. 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 It's a, yes. Basically, it's an autopsy, as you said, on the animal. Yes. So. And and so uh, that's just one, one, one interesting fact. Um, I, I have to say, too, that when I did travel to England, I mean, to Scotland, and uh, one of my boyhood dreams was to go to uh, Inverness. Uh, that's where the, the Loch Ness monster was uh, seen. And I, I was just dumbfounded because I was just listening to some of the stories of uh, what um, what the local fishermen uh, had shared. Because not only is there Loch Ness, but there's a number of other locks, Loch Morar, for example, where other people have seen a Nessie type creature. There, but when when we travel uh, peri- periodically, um, we'll run into people sharing that, aside from a UFO sighting, that they would see some sort of entity or a creature, like a Bigfoot. What what I wanted to uh, go back to the Chupacabra was just recently, um, Kevin, I was involved in an, an investigation through MUFON of a case where a number of animals were were found dead uh, again. There was a gapping wound in the neck, uh, blood, uh, hardly no blood. And when you hear that right away, you think, well, is this paranormal related? <clears throat> this is what it turned out to be. To uh, It turned out that um, these animals uh, uh, that died, at first there was uh, several, and then later there was about approximately 20 um, animals that were killed in in one day. And it turned out that the kill the the killers were were, were pit bulls, strayed pit bulls. And what these pit bulls would do, Kevin, um, especially these were bred to fight. Somehow they had escaped from some place uh, from a ranch, and they went up 
<clears throat> they would immediately bite and hold on to the necks of, 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 the, of the victim. They would hold on to them until they would ble- bleed to death, and then they would keep killing and killing. And the, the footprints were found among the carnage of the dead animals. Well, later I started also uh, started to look up on the Internet on, on the uh, killings of livestock by wild dogs and came across a lot of different interesting articles about how a number of, of ranch, how a number of livestock um, have been killed by pit bulls or, or vicious dogs. So not every. So then it just uh, that just reinforced the fact that just there might be something paranormal related, but then later you will find that there is an explanation of that, and that's something that we we need to keep in mind. Uh, but I, I just uh, wanted to share that with, with you real quickly. Well, we have very few minutes left, so I will ask a question that I hope we don't get really involved in. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Chupacabra. We've mentioned Bigfoot. Is there any other cryptoid that you've really been investigating that's uh, interesting we might not have heard about? Well, uh, oh, I, I just wanted to the, – the connection with the Bigfoot is, is still very, very fascinating to me. And there's a gentleman, you probably may have heard of him. Uh, he's a Border Patrol agent, just retired – um, named Ricky Elmore, and he did a, a book about his experience and also all these interesting paranormal uh, or sightings along the border. And um, the, we've come up with close to with with a number of uh, stories about Bigfoot, but also along the border because these these creatures are are also seen on the other other side. I mean, it's not an, an, a fence or anything that's separating it. You have these strange creatures that are that are also being cited. Um, uh, the other one is the Mothman. I, I'm getting reports from a friend of mine that there is a number of so-called Mothman sightings that are occurring also in the desert area of Chihuahua. Uh, so uh, I, just, uh, let, me, I let me interrupt. Collect let me, these stories. Let me, mm-hmm. let me interrupt. To to uh, Mothman is sort of a large owl-like creature that. Uh, uh, I guess manifested itself originally in uh, West Virginia, and John Keel was involved in the investigation. So you're suggesting a Mothman-like creature has migrated, if you will, to the the border of Texas or southern Texas? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I don't know if it, if it migrated, but the fact that it's something very similar is being reported uh, also. that uh, So I, I'm keeping these uh, reports that are being sent to me from <clears throat> from uh, from my friend as well as from other sources uh, that I think maybe that might be a, a eventual direction for us to to do more research and maybe do a book on, on something like that. But, uh, yeah, I, I keep an open mind, Kevin, and as you know, I'm sure you you're, you deal with this too, that you, you never know what, what information may come be thrown your way. And when, as it keeps on re- repeating, then all of a sudden it says, well, maybe this is something worthwhile to look into. Well, Ruben, we go, we're just flat out of time here. So let me thank you for joining us. Um, you can be found at uh, www.northerncaliforniamufon.com or www.mufon.com. And, of course, your books can be found at www.roswellbooks.com. And um, if the people have questions, um, they can, of course, hit my blog, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com, and I can pass those along if uh, we don't have any other way. So let me thank you uh, once again for taking your time here to share some of that with us. And Thank uh, you, Kevin. And we cert- certainly yeah. enjoyed it. We, uh, For those of you who are very interested in cryptoids, uh, take a look at uh, www.stopkillingbigfoot.com, and there's a petition there to be signed. And I guess there is a... A documentary that is in production or they're talking about doing it or something like that in which they're going out to hunt down Bigfoot so they can prove that it actually exists and that sort of thing. So we, I, I'm not sure that's really such a swell idea. So take a look at www.stopkillingbigfoot.com. And as I've said many times, if you want more information about what's gone on this afternoon or this evening in, this, uh, in the program, take a look at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And for those that are interested in UFO crashes, 
uh, especially the ones that I've been researching. I've done a cold case reinvestigation of the Roswell case. I looked, tried to look at all the information that was available on that. And the book is called Roswell in the 21st Century. You can get it as an e-book. You can uh, get it as a, a regular uh, print book on demand. There's a lot of footnotes in it, and they're uh, in the e-book, they're all stuck at the end of the book, and I'm not sure how valuable that is and in the uh, print version they're right there on the page so you can take a quick look at that we will be back next week with uh, another guest Nick Redfern who I think you're all familiar with so uh, take a listen to that and we will return in 167 hours <laughs> <laughs>